few minutes past, so I'll welcome you to Intersectional DEI, We Are Nobody Without Everybody, presented by Michelle Gans. Um, welcome to the SOA conference, uh, first live stream session of the day, and in person. So um, I'm going to get started. I don't think I need to cover any housekeeping. I already know where the restrooms are, and you're already here, so we're good to go. Um, <laughs> so I'll just get started here. Uh, I'll welcome Michelle, and I'll read her bio real quick. Michelle Gans is the Archives Director for the Dominican Sisters of Peace. She has previously worked in academic, museum, corporate, and private archives. Michelle is deaf, mixed race, mixed race, queer, and weird, which gives her a unique view of archival theory and practice. She has been a mentor for over 15 years, serving on the mentoring committee twice, as well as participating in the cohort mentoring program. She also does one-off mentoring for anyone who asks and offers advice and support to archivists on listservs and in social media groups. Michelle has served in section leadership roles in the Accessibility and Disability section, the Independent Archivist section, and the Lone Ranger section. She has also served on several section steering committees and appointed task force. She is part of the working group who first developed the best practices for working with archives researchers with physical disabilities in 2008. She has served as an SAA representative for ALA Committee on Cataloging and has served on two ARM ARMA uh, international working groups. She has spoken about DEI for most of her career and works to support others who speak on the topic. Michelle regularly speaks to MLIS students in classes, in, symp in symposia, and, um, and through keynote presentations. Michelle was a recipient of the 2020 Spotlight Award and subject of a 2020 Council Resolution honoring the Accessibility and Disability Section Steering Committee. Michelle has spoken on numerous SAA panels, taught workshops and at web webinars for SAA, MAC, and the SGA and has been published numerous times. She was most recently the co-chair of the 2023 SAA host committee and has served as the first region of member services with ACA. Michelle is currently a new member of the of SAA council. Michelle received her MLIS from the University of Arizona in 2006, her archival certification in 2008, and her bachelor's in uh, medieval literature from the Ohio State University in 2003. So now let's welcome Michelle. Thank you. And I would first like to say that I am so impressed with this conference and how it was put together. For the first time ever, we had breaks in between virtual sessions yesterday. And I got to tell you, as a hard of hearing person dealing with Zoom, that was wonderful. I was actually able to engage the whole day. So I want to congratulate everyone on the committee for, for creating such an inclusive environment. All right, now let's jump right in here. I'd like to start with I'd like to start with changing this. There we go. Okay, um, I first wanted to start with a land acknowledgement statement as Dominican Sisters of Peace and Associates, uh, Dominican Sisters of Peace and Associates, we give thanks for the sacred lands on which we gather and express our gratitude to the peoples who have cared for this holy land. We acknowledge that our Columbus Mother House and this conference center occupy the ancestral and contemporary territory of the Shawnee, Potwami, Delaware, Miami, Peoria, Seneca, Wyandotte, Ojibwa, and Cherokee peoples. We lament the forced removal of these tribes through the Indian Removal Act of 1830, and we honor the resilience of tribal nations and recognize the historical context that continue to affect the indigenous peoples of this land. This is our formal statement. I would like to tack on to this that as Ohioans, we all have a lot of work to do to, to rectify some of the horrible things that have happened to Native peoples in the state. All right, so here are the ground rules. We treat everyone with kindness. There are no stupid questions. And this is a safe place. Please act accordingly. Um, if you have questions, do not be afraid to ask them at any point during this session. And just as reference, the SAA Code of Conduct basically says, be nice to each other. <laughs> I want you to think about how others move through the world and the ways that we can allow people to thrive regardless of how they move through the world. 
If you leave this presentation with nothing else, remember that everybody moves through the world differently and we need to allow them to do so. So let's take a step back first and talk about intersectional identities. These are all the ways that we are we. Um, and what this shows us is that people are complex. No one is the same as anyone else. Everyone has issues they are dealing with. There is no way to know the battles that someone is fighting. And that disability crosses all identities. Accessibility tools are inherently inclusive. And inclusion must take disability into account. So what is it that we mean when we say we're going to talk about DEI? So the letters stand for diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I always like to add an extra I on the end of that for intersectionality. So diversity is the idea that we have a wide range of uh, identities, including race, ethnicity, gender, age, national origin, religion, disability, sexual orientation, socioeconomic status, education status, marital status, language, veteran status, physical appearance, etc. Equality is the idea that we give fair access and treatment and opportunity to everyone. But if you notice, equality means everybody stands on the same size box. But that doesn't mean that we necessarily get to see over the fence. Equity means everybody gets what they need so they can see over the fence. But what we're going for is justice. There shouldn't be a fence here at all. Everyone should just be able to see without standing on a box. So let's take a look at some statistics and the demogra uh, demographics of our archi archival profession. Uh, archives are mostly looked at through the white male able-bodied gaze. History is thoroughly whitewashed and able-washed. First-hand accounts of marginalized people were given less value in favor of white accounts, and so those marginalized accounts become, become erased, become pushed under, um, and a lot of this is because there isn't a lot of diversity within the archival world. We are getting better. We have doubled the percentage of, of uh, racial diversity within the archival profession, and um, we've doubled it from 8% to 16%. Not great, but we're getting better. When it comes to disability, things are a little bit scarier. So when we look at our history, and I'm going to do this really briefly because Lydia Tang is going to cover this in depth in her keynote later. Um, 2002... We created a joint working group for accessibility in archives and records management. In 2009, the working group started creating actual documents. In 2017, we created a task force to review best practices on accessibility. Um, and those initial ones were adopted in 2010. I got to be a part of that original group, and I have to tell you, we were so concerned about getting people physically into the archives. Are your spaces wide enough for wheelchairs to come in? Do you have tables that are adjustable? That we actually forgot about disabil uh, invisible disabilities. I forgot about my own disability when we were writing these, these policies, because at that point, just physical access to the space was still a high priority. Um, in 2017, we updated those to include invisible disabilities, to include archival workers, because initially we were just looking at getting our patrons through doors. Um, and then that sort of built and built. And then in 2019, we founded the Accessibility and Disability section. And since the section has been founded, they have been making great strides to really make as much information as as freely available as possible to archivists who want to make their diverse their um, repositories more diverse. 
All right, so now we're going to sort of skip and uh, move into what we mean when we talk about archival accessibility. And generally, when we talk about accessibility, we're talking about, you know, can you get to the finding aids online? Can you easily get to information in terms of literal access to the information? Here, we're talking about how do people who access information differently get that same equality that everybody else gets in terms of access. So the first thing I want to remind you is that accessibility is, in fact, the law. And you cannot say, well, it costs us too much money to put a push button on the door, so we're just not going to do it. Someone can sue you for that, and you really don't want to get sued because you didn't put a push button in that costs maybe a couple hundred bucks. You need to weigh the immediate cost against the potential future cost and the potential damage to your reputation. People don't like it when you don't make things accessible. <laughs> A lot of times, this mostly just means creating an environment and an atmosphere that is open to diversity. Do you make your process for asking for an accommodation easy to do? Or is it buried under 13 pages of course, that kind of thing? So keep in mind that the goal of art is to make the materials accessible. We need to think beyond finding aids to a more holistic approach to how people interact with archives, institutions, and archival materials. So let's start with some low-cost, no-cost solutions because there are a multitude of these. You do not need to spend thousands of dollars to make your reading rooms more accessible. So we're going to talk a little bit more about websites, reading rooms, and how to make the materials themselves accessible. Okay, when we are looking at our reading rooms, there's a couple of things you can do. Pads of paper and pencil at the reading desk. So if someone is uh, is deaf and they cannot speak to you, they can write down what they want to say. You can write down your response. And that way there's open communication. I use a program called Otter AI. There are a number of these programs out there. Um, You can get it for free. You download it onto your tablet. You click a button. It transcribes kind of like we're doing right here, transcribes the conversation. So they can easily understand what you're saying and they can respond back either by typing in or, um, or communicating some other way. Similarly, Google Translate, it's not perfect. But it's better than nothing at all. If you have a patron that comes in that speaks a different language, you should be able to communicate that with them, at least basically. And Google Translate will help you do that. I like to recommend that we do adjustable tables and chairs. I recognize that those tables and chairs are very expensive. I just bought a very small raising table, and it was like 300 bucks for just one of them. But I made the room in the budget for just one, and one is enough. you got to start somewhere, and you start with one smaller table, and then you can work your way up to it. One thing I would recommend that you try to figure out how to do is have a separate space where people can be loud, can be quiet, can go and sit if they become overwhelmed or traumatized by the material they're looking at. A separate space that's separate from the regular reading room that gives people a little bit of privacy. Um, I am very loud, so when I talk to a reference archivist, we need to go into another room so I don't disrupt the other picture. That kind of thing. Um, and you also think about it as, you know, a nursing room, uh, it can be a multi-use room that fills many accessibility needs. Um, and then look around your environment and say, what is our space say? I know someone whose reading room has a giant painting when you walk in the door, and it's called The Hanging Tree. And it is humongous, and it is literally the first thing you see when you walk in the door. They cannot remove it because the guy who funded the building gave the painting and said, you got to keep the painting. So what they did is they created a lot of signage 
explaining what the painting was, why it was there, and letting people know before they even opened the door that there was going to be something traumatic as soon as they walked in. It's not a great way to do it. Ideally, you would just take the painting down. But I think we all know that we are beholden to our, our um, shareholders. And if they want it to be up, then it is our job to just make people as comfortable as possible with something that's rather offensive. I try to think of it as a teaching moment. You know, this used to be acceptable and here's why it's not. Um, okay. And now let's move to um, websites. So websites are how most people find our archives nowadays. And it is really important that you make your website accessible. There are all sorts of tools you can use to, um, to check and make sure your website is, is compatible with, with um, things like screen readers, magnifiers, things like that. There is also a, 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 a a website called UserWay, and what you can do is you go there, you have this code that you click off their website, you embed it into your code, and it creates a suite of accessibility tools that appear right on your, your screen. So it's screen magnifier, uh, it'll change the contrast from white uh, black letters to white letters with a black background. Um, you can change the colors dramatically. It'll uh, com uh, connect directly to a screen reader. So it's completely free. And it's just a really easy way to just immediately update your website. Um, alt text is really important. And it needs to be more than people sitting at a table. You need to say there is a person with blonde hair wearing a blue shirt sitting at the table. There is a person with brown hair wearing a white sweater who is sitting at the table. You give them a little bit of description on what it is. Um, and then provide options for viewing material media differently. So you can create a JPEG and you can create a PDF. The PDF can be word searchable. Um, I'm pretty sure that the most basic version of PDF will still let you OCR the document, which just makes it that much easier for people to search for exactly what they're looking for, especially if they have difficulty reading, reading the text. Um, and it actually works on handwriting. It's not great, but again, it's better than nothing. Um, make everything easy to he hear and see. So don't have a lot of flash that is flashing. I don't think anybody uses flash anymore, but you know, don't have a lot of things that, that pop in and out on your website. You want everything to be static. Um, you want to check it against a screen read. Um, Lydia is going to demo some of those for us later today. So you'll get to see the, how those work firsthand. Um, but things like make sure your videos have captioning. If you, have a video and it doesn't have captioning, you can run it through Otter AI. It will create a caption for you and then you can actually embed the captions into the video. Um, you can run them through YouTube. YouTube does captions as well. Again, not great, but it's better than nothing. Um, another thing that I want to remind people is that a lot of fonts and backgrounds and styles look very cute if you are perfectly have perfectly good vision. And if your vision is remotely bad, it's gonna, it just makes it really, really difficult. And the problem is, is that if you run into too many barriers as a disabled person, you're going to be like, you know what, I'm done. And I'm just, I'm not going to look at it. And you don't want to turn people away just because you don't have a little bit of accessibility. Um, and also, just make sure your your spelling and your grammar is correct. Um, it's a little tough to do because our brains like to fix things on. I just got an email from someone at work who informed me that we ran off 50 copies of something and the word dedication is spelled wrong. We looked at it a dozen times and I could have sworn it was right. So now we have to reprint that page. Um, but be willing to make those quick changes if you do. Um, and you'll see there's a link down here. I actually pulled this from the internet. The internet is a treasure trove of information for how to do this. Nobody is reinventing the wheel here. Everybody has done this already. Find someone else who's done it and copy their work. Okay, so this, this is my biggest pet peeve right now. 
every job posting that we see says you must be able to live 40 pounds. Really, we must be able to live 40 pounds. There's no one else in the building who can help us. And and they a lot of places make this like a requirement. And I've known some disabled people who have not gotten jobs because they're like, you can't lift a 40 pound box over your head. Really? Do we do that that often? No, we don't. Um, in my archive, I work with a lot of very old women. So all of our boxes are those little half phase boxes. They cost, they, they're what, four pounds max, and even an 85-year-old can actually lift it up over her head. So there is no reason to say this. All it does is gatekeeps people from applying for jobs. Um, and when you're thinking about this sort of thing, ask yourself, okay, so I'm telling people that if they are not perfectly able, they can't work here. Am I also telling them that I don't make accommodations for accessibility at all? Because, gosh, that... That's not right. And again, completely illegal. So, so you, you have to ask yourself, what am I saying in my job posting? Do I make accessibility easy to see? So my favorite job postings are the ones that say, we offer the following accommodations right in the posting. The ones that say, click here for our accessibility options. The ones that give you the questions ahead of time. This not only helps people with ADHD and other processing disorders, honestly, it helps everyone. When you go into an interview, you're crazy nervous. You're worried about what you're going to say. Having those questions ahead of time doesn't allow people to cheat. It allows them to present their best face forward. Um, so just kind of look at the application process and say, okay, am I making people jump through all of these hoops for no reason? My favorite ones are the ones where they say, submit your resume and your cover letter, and then spend the next 20 minutes filling all that information out on this, this website. There's no reason to do it this way unless your institution is absolutely insistent that you do it that way. And if that's the case, then look at seeing if you can work around it by just letting people email their resumes and their, and their cover letters to you. I see no point in filling out the same information twice. Um, yeah, so again, this is one of those things where you can't necessarily do everything, but whatever you can do is better than nothing. So, when it comes to the job interview, disclosure can be a little tricky. I tend to not disclose that I'm deaf until I get to the in-person interview because I have had people act weird as soon as they find out, like doing that thing where everybody yells and talks really slowly and those weird things that people do when they don't understand disability. But the thing that I realized is... If I was in a wheelchair, I would have no choice but to disclose because they would need to know that I need separate, you know, I need accommodations. So I'm working on trying to disclose earlier. This is a highly, highly personal thing. You do not have to disclose if it does not make you feel comfortable. And, and I want to make sure that people really understand that you under no obligation to tell people personal things about yourself at an interview. Um, the realities of disclosure is there are a lot of places who are not going to hire you because you're disabled. I have a friend who became disabled right after they started their job and their boss said to him, if we knew you were going to become disabled, we wouldn't have hired you. This is not how people treat other people. So treat everyone with kindness. Um, but again, when it comes to yourself, treat yourself with kindness, especially in the interview process, which is already fraught with anxiety. If it makes you more anxious to tell people, then don't tell them. Um, ideally, they will give you the questions ahead of time. They will ask you if you're comfortable with walking all over campus. And they will ask you if you want to go out for a meet or not. A lot of people will work the meal into the interview process because they'd like to see how you interact with other people. But quite frankly, it doesn't always need to revolve around food. Um, a lot of people have eating disorders or who just don't want to eat during the day or don't want to eat during the interview. Give them options. Let's go get a cup of tea. Let's go sit under this patio. It doesn't have to involve 
Um, and I think we tend to default to food because this is one, it is sort of the standard thing that you do with people that you have not met before. Um, try to think of alternative things, especially if you're not sure if someone is going to be comfortable with it or not. All right, so this is a lot. Accessibility and disability is a humongous topic that no one person can ever tackle on their own. So what can you do as an individual and as an organization? And I want you to remember that you are not required to do anything that makes you uncomfortable. You do not need to be a vocal advocate or driving force behind every DEI effort or initiative. It's really enough to be kind to your coworkers, to be understanding of differences and to try to be inclusive. And this means things like inviting people to lunch that normally don't get invited out. So like if a group of you go to lunch every week at work, then invite someone who you know doesn't get invited to lunch and make accommodations for them. If they do not eat meat, then Find a restaurant that has vegetarian options. They all do, you know, things like that. Um, engage with people on a social level. You know, what did you do this weekend? What are your plans? Did you have fun? Did you check out this new thing? Rather than just engaging on a professional level, because as we get to know each other as people, those disabilities stop being so different because we recognize them as just part of the person. Um, I like to to be a devil's advocate when people are being rude or mean. And I will, like, especially with those jokes that aren't really jokes that, you know, are at the expense of someone, I feign misunderstand. I, I don't understand the joke. Can you explain it to me? And, you know, if someone has to explain a horrible joke, they realize it's not a funny joke. And, you know, it's, it's better than being like, wow, that was really a jerk move, you know? <laughs> um, I like to gentle, cor gently correct people, especially with misgendering. And I think we're seeing a lot of this where people tend to be like, yeah, it's, you know, it's your pronouns, but it's really not that important. But it is. So if you if you're talking about someone, for example, my best friend came out as non-binary. Um, for 30 years, they were a she, and now they are they. And I still make mistakes, but the way to do it is. She said, oh, they said, you just gently correct yourself, gently correct the person that you're talking to. Um, I do this a lot with my husband. She said this, she, they certainly did. You just use the correct pronoun. And so it's not directly calling someone out, but it's, it's correcting the mistake anyway. Um, with things like posters, when you do, uh, things on your walls. Don't default to Simpsons Yellow. Look for diverse examples. And I think we're seeing a lot more of that now where everything is in, you know, stock photos of, of you know, pretty white people doing weird things. It's you, You've got a lot more options out there now. Um, include your pronouns in your email. And I tell people that this is really important to do, even if you have cisgender pronouns, because it shows people that they are safe using their pronouns in front of you and that you are trying to make the space more inviting and more welcoming to people who choose to use they, them, or whatever pronouns they choose to use. And the thing is, is you don't have to understand it. You just have to respect it. So what is advocacy? Well, and what does this mean in terms of advocating for yourself and advocating for others? I will fight tooth and nail to advocate for someone else. When it comes to myself, I'm like, oh, that's okay. I'll make it work. Um, it's harder to advocate for yourself than it is for other people. Um, so ideally, you are in an environment where other people will actually stick up for you as well. So if it's, an, it's a welcoming environment, then we all support each other. Um, so like I said, it's, you know, are you comfortable calling out inappropriateness, inappropriate behavior, inappropriate touch, and inappropriate words? You don't have to be. And that's the thing, is that 
it can be enough for you to recognize that something has happened to someone and go up to them later and say, are you okay? I noticed that this happened. I just want to make sure, you know, if you need to talk, let me, that kind of thing is, is enough of an advocacy. Um, a big thing I also like to do when I'm talking to someone who's clearly just gone through something traumatic, do you want event to vent or do you want solutions? Because sometimes people just need to vent and sometimes they actually need concrete examples of what they can do. So ask the person. And you know what? Sometimes venting is enough to make them figure it out on their own. Other times they need to talk it out. And if you have any help you can provide, awesome. If nothing else, you have at least given them someone to, to unload it off of. Because if you keep it inside, that's how you get ulcers. And yeah, and it's not good. So getting it out is always important. <laughs> So, uh, when we talk about DEI and allyship, the idea is, is that you are an ally to everyone, not just a specific group or a specific person. Um, a lot of times this sort of allyship comes in the form of using your privilege for good. So if you are privileged enough to be in a management position, then do everything you can to make your department as intersectional as possible. Um, if you, there's a lot of times where if I go to someone and say something, they go, oh, look at that angry brown woman. But if my white colleague goes to them and says the exact same thing, they go, oh, that's really great. Let's totally do that. I don't care who says it as long as it gets through the people. So recognize that you may have the ability to say things that other people do. Okay, so let's talk about some specific examples here. Um, Misty is a big fan of going into committees and a lot of times you'll have a committee where it's 95% white people and then one or two people of color or one or two people with disability. And when the conversation starts about what we're going to do, Misty will jump in and say, we're not going to ask Michelle to do all the labor on this, right? So I'll take on this, you take on that. And so she basically, they step in and, and, Keep that one person who, who is the center of whatever action is going to happen for being the one who has to do the emotional and physical labor. I am happy to help people with disability stuff, but if I have an ear infection, I don't want to spend an hour in a meeting talking about disability accessibility things. Um, I do a lot of allyship in the form of speaking to others on behalf of someone, especially someone who's been newly diagnosed with a, uh, uh, a disability or is in the process of getting a diagnosis. They may not feel comfortable talking to a manager about what they may need in terms of like, you know, staggered work schedules or taking extra time off or needing extra time to complete a project. So I will go in on their behalf, talk to management. I can even do it anonymously so the person doesn't get outed because not everybody wants everyone to know that they have a disability. So those kinds of conversations are a wonderful way to be an ally. And then I want to give you an example of something that really happened that was very bad, but the allyship that came out of it was kind of awesome. So I was at a position and we had Slack that we used to talk to everybody and someone posted something about an article and I said, oh, this is a really great article, but I wish they had taken disability into consideration. And it started a huge fight on this public Slack channel that the bosses and the owners and everybody was involved in. And the person said to me that I was being unprofessional because I brought up disability. It was horrible. I mean, this went on for like 45 minutes. And one of my colleagues texted me while this was all going on and said, I feel really uncomfortable with this. Are you okay? And then after it was over, she emailed me and said, I was so uncomfortable with this. I went to HR while it was happening and told them this was unacceptable. So HR got involved. 
I didn't have to go to them and seem like I'm the person who's pushing this bad thing. So a neutral third party took this to HR. The issue ended up being resolved because this third party person stepped in and said something. And she didn't even have to be confrontational about it. She just sent an email to HR saying, this is what's happening. It's, it's not okay. Please do something about it. So that was one of the greatest things that she could have done for me because I would not have gone to HR on my own. I would have just been like, this is how things roll with me. We're going to just deal with it. And the fact that she was so willing to do that on my behalf was really, really touching for me. And a lot of times that's all disabled people are asking for is that someone just lend us a hand without us having to ask for it. A lot of what this accessibility stuff boils down to is disrupting old patterns. So we get a lot of, but that's how we've always done this in the archival world. I think we are all sick of hearing this is how we've always done it, because clearly that is not true. At some point, we went from typewriters to computers. Although, how many of you still have a typewriter in your office? I don't know why we keep it, but just in case, we still have one. <laughs> so this means modeling the behavior you want to see. You know, being kind to people. Asking people how they're doing, asking how they're feeling, asking how their families are, you know, treating each other like people. Um, prior to prioritizing a work-life balance is really important in this, too, because most disabled people, we have five spoons that we are working with. If I take me two spoons to get ready to go to work in the morning, that means I have three spoons left for work. If I have to spend two of my spoons fighting with someone over the fact that I am deaf, I have one spoon left to do my work and whatever else I want to do at the end of the day. So it is very important that we prioritize the work-life balance. We should not be proud of ourselves for working 60 hours a week. Nothing that we are doing in the archives is brain surgery. No one is going to die if we don't get it done today. And I know that I personally get stuck in that fallacy of, well, the more I get done, the better it is. But if I hurt myself, then it doesn't do any anybody any good. In fact, I push myself so hard, I uh, got an inflamed nerve and was out for an entire week because I just could not function anymore. My body literally collapsed. That was the incorrect way to do that. We don't do that anymore. We leave at 4.30. We do not work from home. That's the other thing, too. We all tend to answer emails from home. And again, they can wait until tomorrow morning when you get into the office. By prioritizing the work-life balance, it makes it be better for everyone, not just people who are disabled. It keeps regular archivists from burning out because we all burn out at some point. It keeps us engaged in our work and we produce better work when we are rested and we have a fulfilling life outside of work. If you are in a management position, it's a little bit more difficult because you have to figure out how to check in regularly with your folks without being a micromanager and without being intimidating. Um, especially for folks who are new to the profession, it can be very intimidating when you're working in an archive with, you know, a professional archivist that's been there for a decade. You want to look great. But looking great doesn't have to hurt yourself because, quite frankly, anybody can get a disability at any time. So, you know, if you keep pushing yourself too hard, you might break something. And that's really, it's not necessary. Um, when you're providing feedback to someone, always make sure that it's coming from a place of, of concern about the person's well-being, not concern about the work. So we have to try to hold our systems accountable. When you are in a leadership or management position, you have the ability to affect policy, procedures, workflows, and you should absolutely inject accessibility and disability into all of those phases. You should have a, a disability uh, uh, injected workflows, policies, procedures, um, that comes in the form of, of giving people more than one project to work on. 
So if if you have one project that involves a lot of sitting, give them also give me a project that involves, you know, filing things so they can get up and move around a little bit. Those sorts of things. Um, make sure that no one is ever punished for their disability. I like to think that we've moved on from that in the world, but I do think that some people do get punished for it. So recognizing that if someone has dyslexia, it's going to take them longer to get through a document than it will if you don't. And you build that time into the workflows. Um, regardless of where you are in the department, you can see things that are happening. Ideally, you will have an open door with your manager that will allow you to go to someone and say, oh, I'm seeing this, you know, someone getting taken advantage of and it's really making me uncomfortable. Can you do something about it? Because a lot of times management spends all their time in meetings and very little time in the trenches. So if there's something going on that they are not aware of, they can't fix it. So Become practice being comfortable with, with bringing things up. And again, it doesn't have to be face to face, it can be via email or text. Um, support changes that come down from above. So I think we all get a little annoyed when we completely change a process for how we do things. But if we have changed that process to make it more accommodating for people, be excited about the change anyway. Even if maybe you don't think it's the greatest thing on earth, it's still you need to support those changes from above because that's how change organically grows. And then I always like to tell people, model the behavior you want to see. You know, treat everyone the way you want to be treated. And in general, you know, remember we're all people here. A lot of the ways we do this is fostering inclusivity. So my favorite thing about this photo here is during this time period, uh, African-Americans were being uh, kicked out of swimming pools. This was when we had people being leached in the pools. Um, it was very bad. Mr. Rogers invited Mr. Clemens, who incidentally was a gay man, um, to put his feet in the pool with him. This one act of inclusivity changed the mindset of millions of kids. I, I, I know I was radical, radicalized by Mr. Rogers and this sort of, of radical inclusivity. But the way he did it was so hard for the course. Of course he's going to invite him to sit in the pool. So what is he saying? This is norm. The more normalization we have of othering the less people are up. So what this means is when you're using examples, don't use Jane and John. Use different names. Jose, Tina, you know, just pick different names. Um, when you do displays, make sure that they are, are inclusive. Include a disabled writer. Include uh, an African writer not just African-American, include, you know, include a multitude of diversities of, of identities and uh, abilities. And in your signage, look at the language you are using. We tend to use a lot of very flowery language. Um, we've all got master's degrees. We know a lot of stuff. We know a lot of big words. We don't have to always use them just because we know them. If you're talking to a group of archivists, go ahead and use that technical language. If you're talking to your patrons, for goodness sake, they're not going to know and respect the fonds. Is. They don't even know what a fond is. And they don't need to know. They just need to know that we keep things in the order that they were created. So use the language that, that meets people where they're at. Oh, and another thing is acknowledge all religious holidays, not that just the Judeo-Christian ones. Um, I noticed this year that during Ramadan, a lot of organizations were saying things like, respect your colleagues who are uh, fasting during the day. They may not be on top of it as usual. You know, letting people know it is okay to, to practice their religion while still at work. Um, and, and I think we can make those accommodations for every religion that is out there. So we talked about this a little bit, but leveraging your privilege for good is one of the greatest ways you can be an ally. 
If you can say something that I can't say, then you are helping me. Not only are you helping me, you're helping everybody else who's hard of hearing. You're helping people who maybe aren't hard of hearing, but, you know, are just having a rough time of it today and can't really hear that well. Um, maybe they have an ear infection and they can't hear that well. Maybe the room is filled with white noise and they can't hear that well. Making accommodations helps everybody. And if you could point out one little thing that we can change... It snowballs to more progress. Um, I try to be as mentor as much as possible because I had to learn the hard way how to navigate the world as a disabled person and a mixed race person. And so I don't want anyone to go through the crap that I dealt with. So I mentor literally everybody who reaches out to me. Um, you do not have to be a mentor to everyone, but if you can offer a kind word to someone, because a lot of times a half an hour conversation with someone who goes, I understand what you're talking about. I, I would like to try to help you with this. What about this? That one little conversation will bolster a, an attitude for months at a time. Um, and whenever possible, be a leader. Um, I like to represent mixed race, disabled people by showing, you know, we can do everything that everybody else can do. And my hope is that by demonstrating leadership, it will it will inspire someone who's new to the profession to do the same thing. But like I said in the beginning, you don't have to. I don't want people to feel obligated to be an ally, to be a mentor, to be a vocal leader. It is enough to simply support other people who are doing this. Changes happen tiny little steps at a time. We are not talking about flipping an organization 180 degrees into something that has never been before. We're talking about tiny little things that build to positive change. So that means things like regularly checking in with your colleagues, making sure that everybody's feeling all right, especially after another shooting happens or another disaster happens. Check in with people. Make sure that they are feeling good. Make sure that they have the tools that they need to, to make their way through life. Um, again, be comfortable calling out inappropriateness. Support from the sidelines. Use your privilege for good. You don't have to lead the way, but you do have to give people the space in order to create the change that they want to see. So you don't have to lead, but you do have to get out of the way. And I want to remind you that for all of us, mental health is really important. Um, if you are disabled, it's even more important. But we should all be working on things that do something for yourself. Reading, meditating, stretching. My therapist told me that doing... Um, Self-care stuff is really good for your mental health. So once a week, I do my nails and I do a face mask, which seems very silly, but it's 20 minutes where I'm poking at my face and not thinking about anything else. It's something that makes me feel more relaxed once I'm done. And I want to leave you with this. Changing mindsets starts by celebrating differences rather than trying to get everyone to try to fit into an existing culture. It means respectfully asking questions, being open to new ideas, and finding ways to connect with each other as people. The status quo is comfortable. It's easy to just keep going the way we've always done. But remaining static only ensures irrelevancy. Like anything, anything changing uh, the status quo means changing how you think about things and how you approach everything. But don't panic. Because positive change is made through millions of small actions, not giant leaps. It's important to remember that when someone is othered, their agency and their humanity is stripped away. Everyone deserves to be treated as a fellow human being. You don't have to help, but you do need to get out of the way. And I want to leave you with this quote from Dr. Hill. Never be cruel. Never be cowardly. Hate is always foolish. Love is always wise. Always try to be nice. Never fail to be kind. And here's how you can get in touch with me now. Who has questions? Please have questions. <laughs>
question? Uh, I'll put them. Maybe, maybe. I'll bring the mic around to people. I'll put it when I get there. Oh. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, someone online is curious about the name of the tool you mentioned that can embed into the website's code and provide sort of accessibility features. It's called UserWay, all one word, userway.org. U-S-E-R-W-A-Y dot org. Any other questions? I have one. <laughs> um, you mentioned uh, like, internet was a great resource. Do you have, and you mentioned that like Otter AI and a few other ones. Do you have any other specific favorites or anything like that that you can pop your head? That is an excellent question. And I'd love to say there are so many tools now, it's hard to pick a favorite. And that's the great thing is there, for whatever disability there is, I guarantee you there are at least four or five free resources that you can use to make things more accessible for people. Um, yeah, but Otter AI is kind of the one I wave the flag for. <laughs> and a quick follow-up to that, um, I know the internet can be fraught with not so good resources. Are there organizations, groups that you kind of trust more than others and you have like, more faith in or whatnot? Absolutely, and thank you for allowing me to plug the accessibility and disability section of SAA. Um, if you go to their website, um, you can actually join up to three sections of SAA without being a member. I would encourage everyone to join the disability and accessibility section. That group has created a multitude of resources. We have documents there, um, tools that you can use, reviews for things. They have a blog that's really awesome too. Um, so I would start there and then um, Disability Lab is Grayson Brillmeyer. Grayson is amazing. They are one of the premier researchers in disability and accessibility topics. If you go to Disability Lab, they have a bunch of resources there too, um, as well as some tools and reviews and articles that you can read. Any questions from the crowd? So I'm thinking a lot about um, accessibility for my digital collections. So I was wondering if you've got like any like site that you've seen out there that you're like, this is a digital collection that has hit the marks. Excellent question. And I'm going to be ashamed to say that I can't think of one off the top of my head, but the best ones have alt text and have very easy to see screen. Um, it, it has a microphone that allows me to, to, or um, not a, microphone, a magnifier that allows me to make things bigger, um, no flashing stuff on the sides, um, easy navigation. Don't make me use three clicks to go back to the next page. I, I mean, it's very easy to move from one page to the other. Any other questions? Oh, actually, I I lied. Ohio State University. Um, they <laughs> they have someone who's actually a, a disability accessibility coordinator, Joey Schultz. Yeah, talk to him. He knows all the stuff, and he's got tons of documents that um, you can use to create uh, accessibility informed policies. Can you expand on how recognizing people's um, intersecting uh, identities can help organizations? What are the benefits of that? So intersectional identities allow us to connect with material in new and interesting ways. So if I have identities that connect me to a marginalized community, I can now work with those communities to try to bring their voices into the archive. So I operate under the rule that no archive is complete unless every voice is heard. And depending on the group, they are going to be more or less willing to talk to people from archives. I think indigenous peoples are very reticent to work with archives because they have been burned in the past. Um, a lot of disabled people are 
are reticent to work with archives because we've been burned in the past. You know, I get a lot of third-hand accounts about being disabled, and boy, do white men not understand what it is to be a, to be a brown disabled woman. They just don't. Um, so intersectional identities give us a wider view of materials and a wider interpretation of materials, which I think is really important because any collection can be viewed under a new lens and find you can find whole new information about it. I think we see this a lot in like medieval studies where you know you every single word has been you know philosophized to the T, but we could still go back and look at you know how women were treated in the Middle Ages, how to say people were treated, what their accounts look like. So I think it just gives us a broader view of our materials and makes them more, more useful to everybody. I think we have like high home questions. All right. Um, oh, got it. All right. Um, thank you, everyone.